I'd like to welcome you uh, to our report, uh, uh, report launch uh, on our, our latest report on European energy security and looking at how the United States and Europe uh, can best uh, co cooperate uh, in this area. Uh, I, throughout 2019, we've been working on a major grant from the Smith Richardson Foundation uh, to look at ways that the United States uh, and the EU uh, can cooperate on energy security. I might say in spite of the various issues <laughs> that, uh, that we have right now. And last March, we hosted a workshop in Brussels uh, to assess the current state of the regulatory environment in Europe, energy markets, uh, and natural gas infrastructure. And we summarized the findings um, in a report uh, we, that we published last, oh, I don't know, May or June, and that's available, uh, available online now. In that report, we found that gas will continue to play an important role in European energy, in the European energy mix and that supply diversification uh, and strong uh, implementation of the regulatory framework will enable competitive and transparent energy markets, uh, making it challenging for suppliers uh, to use energy as a geopolitical weapon. Uh, when I say those, when I refer to suppliers, we're in a small group here, I guess I can, uh, I guess I can state the obvious, who the obvious one is. Um, but we also stressed the need uh, to develop uh, competitive and transparent markets, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, because that in itself will create energy security, will mitigate the effects of new pipelines like Nord Stream or, uh, or Turkish Stream, uh, assuming, that they, uh, assuming that they do take place, and they, at least they, li they likely will. Um, in October, uh, we had a, a high-level workshop in Berlin uh, to discuss how to strengthen energy security in times of decarbonization, which uh, uh, is so important on the European agenda right now, should be on everybody's agenda, but, uh, and we're lucky also to have Ditte Yul Jorgensen here today, the new Director General, who has been one of the prime movers in that direction. Uh, so today we're launching a report on our findings from that discussion. Uh, an additional extensive research that was, that was done on the topic. Uh, and later this year, this first half of this year, we'll introduce uh, specific recommendations uh, for the U.S. and the EU as to how, <clears throat> as to how that uh, cooperation might take place. Uh, the title is a little funny. Uh, uh, which we're changing in the online on the on, when it's online to make clear that we're talking about clean technologies as well. I want to thank uh, specifically Andra Shimoni, uh, who's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and former Hungarian ambassador to NATO, the first one actually, and also to the United States, uh, who... Uh, uh, has been working with me on it, and I also want to thank a person who many of you have already met, Olga Kakova, from our staff, who it could not have been, could not have been done uh, without her. Let me just briefly, before getting into the, introducing the panel and getting into the, uh, getting into the questions, to just a, f a few takeaways from this uh, latest uh, report. And I think what we learned is that there's a significant, significant potential conflict between the push to decarbonize the economy and the need to prioritize energy security. And we, we need to work together to bridge the gap. I think, and maybe you'll comment on this uh, later due to their you know, issues even now with some of the Central and Eastern European countries and how, you know, how that they'll uh, deal with this. We still think, uh, that gas uh, will be important, uh, certainly in the short to medium term, and bridging this gap um, and providing energy <coughs> security with, <coughs> excuse me, with alternative routes uh, like the Southern Gas Corridor, just as one example, uh, and, al and alternative uh, sources. But at the same time, and I think what we'd like to emphasize uh, is that there are significant opportunities to strengthen 
energy security while at the same time reducing carbon emissions. And decarbonization does not have to happen at the cost of energy security. And new and existing clean energy uh, uh, technologies will be essential uh, to decarbonization, but it'll also be strengthening energy security. The more new technologies are put in place, uh, the less dependence there'll be, for example, on a, uh, on a single supplier um, when, when looking at the, uh, the, Euro the European scene. Uh, so I think, that that's, uh, ver I think that's very important. I think it's critical uh, in what we find, that, and this will be part of our recommendations, that the US and EU cooperate strongly with respect to new technologies and on research with respect to uh, new technologies. Uh, and also at other areas that are not directly tech, well, I guess they are technology related, cybersecurity, cooperating there, cooperating on digitalization, cooperating on critical materials, uh, on dealing uh, with issues in Africa, for example, uh, also, uh, also China. Uh, I think it's necessary that we cooperate in these technology areas. We can't, we can't afford uh, to leave it all to China. Well, I don't want to steal the thunder uh, of the panel, so I think I should uh, uh, briefly introduce the panel. There are going to be no presentations. I'm going to ask direct questions to start, and I'll ask each of the, uh, uh, each of the panelists to uh, uh, be brief uh, in their uh, in their comments, and uh, uh, and we'll maybe go through a round or two, and hopefully we'll get participation from the audience. Uh, I'm going to ask Andras to make some comments after uh, after the panel is completed. So first, uh, we have uh, Dita Dita Yul Jorgensen, who is the new Director General. I guess it's I, I guess it's still new, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the uh, uh, in the um, energy uh, energy directorate, uh, and uh, so we're really looking forward to one working with you as we move forward, uh, and for your comments today, uh, we have Maria Rita Galli. By the way, I'm not going to give extensive biographies; it's all in your materials. Maria Maria Rita Galli uh, from uh, SNAM. Uh, we were fortunate to have your uh, CEO, uh, I see you're not sitting in the order, but that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> your CEO at our gas, gas panel this morning, and he was excellent. We had some polling questions, and as a result of his presentation, there was a huge increase in those supporting the alternative of gas as a vehicle to complement new technologies, uh, including, uh, including hydrogen. Uh, we have uh, uh, Aida Sitikov, who's uh, closer to me, uh, who is from EBRD, and we're going to be interested in your comments on where you think EBRD financing uh, is going. Uh, the, uh, His Excellency Nikolai Havrilet, who unfortunately has to leave at 3 o'clock, so I better stop talking, uh, <clears throat> who is the State Secretary now for Energy in Romania, been head of their regulatory authority prior to that, is, is an old friend. Uh, and then last but not least, even an older friend, uh, not in age, but in time, um, Andrea Lockwood, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, in the Department of Energy, who can talk about a little bit about where the U.S. is going. So <clears throat> let me turn uh, to the Director General and uh, uh, first ask you this. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of alluded, alluded to this before, that uh, even though there are differences that the U.S. and EU has, uh, certainly on our legislative trajectory in terms of CO2 reduction goals, at least during this administration, uh, we have various differences, including on uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, and the sanctions that we just enacted. We'll, we'll see how much, of, how much effect uh, that uh, might, might or might not have. But I should also congratulate you on the deal 
between uh, uh, Nord Stream or between uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, and uh, or gas yeah Ukraine and Gazprom, uh, which certainly was uh, certainly was a lot more positive than I thought was going to happen. So that that is you know very helpful. But the question is, in spite of all of these differences that we may have. Uh, Energy traditionally has been a good area, I think, of cooperation. Uh, and how can we make it continue? How can it continue under the circumstances to be so? And do you think we can cooperate? And in what areas do you think we can cooperate? Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you for the invitation to uh, to participate in this sec in this uh, session. And thank you for the very interesting report that um, uh, that, that we are discussing. Um, I think you're absolutely right in identifying energy as one of the very positive areas in the EU-US cooperation. Um, we are building on it. We have our 10th anniversary of the EU-US Energy Council this year, and we have had a close cooperation on a, a broad range of energy-related uh, issues. So we may have different approaches to some aspects of energy, but on the whole, we are going in the same direction, and I think the large objectives um, are very much shared. I would like to point to a couple of specific issues that we are already working on and other issues where I think we can further strengthen as well. Now, one is that what we are seeing in our long-term uh, strategy and, uh, and assessments is that gas will remain important for us in terms of energy security for the transition uh, in particular. And what we need to make sure is that we move towards the decarbonization of gas. Now, one of the big challenges globally and one that both the EU and the US face and where we can work together, which is also identified in the report, is to address methane emissions that are related to, uh, to natural gas. So there, I think, is a very concrete example of something where we can significantly impact um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and make our, uh, our supply uh, cleaner and, um, and safer. You also rightly mentioned new technologies, innovation uh, and research. I think there are a number of areas there where we have an interest in working together. One such example would be hydrogen, which I think is generally recognized as a necessary uh, storage and energy carrier in the coming years, including hydrogen based on renewable energy. Um, and there I think the markets are beginning to be established. We've got a number of interesting projects both in Europe but also in, uh, in North America. Um, and with other parts of the world. And so I think there's very much scope for cooperation there as well. Then there's a third aspect, which is energy efficiency. The way we put it in Europe is energy efficiency first, essentially because the cheapest and cleanest energy is the energy not used. And so if you talk about energy security and energy independence, it's a good thing to start with energy efficiency. Um, and there I think we will also have uh, common objectives and it would be interesting to, to strengthen that that conversation and see, well, how do we, what are the common objectives? Are there sectors that we're all looking at? And then I think there's a, gener a broader issue around security uh, and energy security. You mentioned cybersecurity, which is a challenge for all of us and where we need to, uh, where I think we have a, a shared interest in working closely together um, across the Atlantic and strengthen the cooperation we have. Uh, we've seen issues of security of grid, um, uh, reliability, which uh, have been challenges in, in the US and where I think some of the market integration and interconnections and grids we have established in Europe, um, are, is, that's one way of going about it and I think we can have useful uh, cooperation around that. You also rightly pointed to the fact, Ambassador, that security of supply and a green transition are not at odds. On the contrary, um, renewable energy, clean energy um, is also a way of becoming energy independent and of uh, using our own um, our own means, and so again, I think there is an interest in in uh, in working together around that because um, those are shared objectives, regardless of the approach. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me ask you this: I can't resist uh, from asking because you mentioned the U.S. EU Energy Council, and, and at, at the risk of bragging, I was. Probably that was my idea, frankly, with Hillary back at the beginning. But having said that, where we were most successful with respect to the US EU Energy Council was on the geopolitical side. And that we, where we had the most difficult time, and I, my guess is it's probably still the case, is on the research side and getting you know, our national labs to work together with uh, uh, European institutions and getting the private 
getting the private sector involved. Uh, I get the sense that given some of the geopolitical differences that maybe that's not as successful now as it has been. Uh, can it be? And do you think we can get the cooperation uh, between the various institutions that would be necessary to have the US EU or EU US Energy, it was always in Europe, it was always the EU US Energy Council, uh, to uh, uh, have, uh, uh, have that being a successful way of moving forward. I think we can, um, partly because we can build on the, um, on the success that you, uh, that you were the, at the origin of in terms of the Energy Council and, and 10 years of close cooperation and close dialogue. Um, I think that the technology and the research and technology aspects are so important for the future proving of our, uh, of our energy, both in terms of the green transition, the decarbonization that we are um, embarking on in Europe under the Green Deal, where research and innovation is, of course, an important aspect, but also because we need new technologies for energy security and for cost-effective energy. And so the, the innovation and the research aspects are a necessary part of, of that for both of us. Um, and so while we may have differences in our approaches, um, any innovation and any technology that we work on together and any information and, and knowledge we share will benefit both of us. So it's a win-win uh, agenda. And I'm therefore optimistic in, in, the, in terms of what can we do uh, together. Good. I hope so. Uh, uh, let me go to uh, uh, Maria. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. Because of the time consideration, I go to I'll go to Nikolai uh, first. And Romania is uh, being a, a, a central Central European, Central and Eastern European country, is in an interesting situation. Uh, there have been issues on the uh, infrastructure side. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, for now anyway, uh, Exxon is uh, leaving uh, leaving the Black Sea. Uh, and there have been issues with respect to legislation in Romania. Um, there, the Brua pipeline hopefully still will uh, be, be moving forward. Um, and just to throw one more uh, point into the uh, uh, conversation, um, how do you think Romania will do in meeting the new, uh, uh, the new climate goals uh, that... Uh, uh, that uh, you will be facing, and is it, are they realistic from your standpoint? So a few questions, but hopefully in just a couple, you know, two or three minutes, you can give us a thumbnail stretch, a sketch, and then we'll move forward with the others. Many thanks for your kind invitation. It's a real opportunity for Romania to attend this uh, panel because we are discussing in the um, middle of the competent professional people, uh, very skilled and uh, very implies in new policy uh, as was uh, presented in, especially in Green Deal uh, uh, process. Uh, in Romania, it's very important to say that uh, Romania has a, a new policy for uh, uh, phasing out uh, fired cold power generation power plants and uh, switch to the natural gas. As we know, the new role of natural gas is a very important one. That's why Romania, even having 90% uh, of general demand assuring by the domestic uh, uh, sources, 10 to 12% uh, we uh, need to import. So for us, it uh, was very important to develop uh, strategic uh, investment in the Black Sea. Uh, so there were uh, several years when uh, we discussed and we collaborated with the Exxon company, but due to the unfavorable uh, law, onshore law, and some unexpected uh, uh, regulations uh, determined uh, Exxon to take decision to quit out from this uh, uh, business. So for Romania, it's uh, very important because as uh, we intend to, to switch the power generation to the natural gas. It's very hard to assure the difference because of the lack of uh, infrastructure. I'm speaking uh, actually about the interconnection points. So last summer situation proved that uh, 
several uh, infrastructure tariffs uh, formed so-called pancaking of tariffs. <laughs> so we uh, uh, were forced to pay tariffs for several uh, transmission systems that uh, uh, finally uh, doubled the price in, in Romania. It was very, very uh, important uh, uh, situation because of the uh, so-called uh, third uh, part, uh, uh, third part uh, issue. I'm speaking about the Ukraine, Gazprom, and the uh, uh, European Commission. Romania has taken decision to storage almost whole domestic uh, uh, production. That's why uh, produced and uh, demand that was fulfilled just from import sources. And in that case, uh, in Romania, the prices were doubled, even uh, Romania has own domestic gas. That's why I'm considering that uh, together with the measure that we have taken uh, already in this moment, we uh, eliminated the tax that levied to the industry, and also uh, we uh, we put in, in place a new program in order to finalize liber liberalization process until first of July this year. Uh, we have a very good uh, relationship with the EU, with the European Commission. Uh, we are working together in order to to put in place all measure we need to 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 have. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our intention to, to phase out the power plant on coal and uh, start to work with the power generation based on uh, natural gas. Uh, I, as I presented and I discussed last uh, days, uh, I think that in uh, DG Energy we have to discuss about this situation, about the maybe we can make uh, easier uh, flows on the, during the, the area, during the member states, uh, without imposing uh, supplementary tariffs, especially when we are, uh, uh, we are, in, we are facing a bottleneck situation uh, in interconnection points. Uh, so uh, this situation is also in the, in the, um, the electricity market. Uh, if we are discussing about the internal common uh, energy market, we have to uh, discuss also uh, about the tariffs uh, to avoid uh, curbing uh, the tariffs that are uh, imposing uh, higher prices and uh, uh, costs that uh, finally are, uh, are, uh, are uh, paying, paid by the end consumers. Uh, I think these are, are much important issue that are evolving in our area. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicola. <coughs> Let me ask uh, two questions. Um, one concern that has come up about Exxon leaving uh, is who's going to take its place. And there's been talk of Luke Oil coming in. Uh, there's always the possibility of Chinese coming in. Uh, there are other potential groups uh, that might take it over. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, one, how much of a risk do you think that is? And second, and I realize with the boss sitting here, um, you don't want to say too much about uh, uh, how difficult it might or might not be to reach your goals on the climate side, but how, how, do, how, do you, how realistic do you think it is to meet those goals and also of some of your neighboring countries? Speaking about the replacing uh, the investors, we are looking for, uh, we are discussing in, our, uh, in this moment, some uh, uh, discussion starting with the potential investors in uh, Black Sea side, uh, together with the uh, uh, regulations that we can, and we will uh, for sure fix in order to impose some win-win uh, strategy in order to put in place uh, and use Romanian opportunity having this kind of treasure, natural gas. Uh, for sure, we are not very happy that Lukoil is involved in the discussions, and Romanian government didn't permit uh, their, uh, their entrance in the data, data room uh, because uh, we are looking for the uh, strategic partners that can come just from the EU side or 
uh, NATO partners. And uh, speaking about the goals uh, for uh, uh, clean energy, Romania has fulfilled uh, uh, earlier uh, the, the initial goals for 2020. The target was uh, 24%. Uh, we realized in, I think, in 2017 uh, the, the goals and uh, we presented in, in the new integrated energy plan uh, 2027. The Commission uh, uh, asked us to, to increase up to 34 uh, until th 2030. Uh, we are also presented 31%. We are still in debates, in discussions, and uh, my personal personal uh, perception is that Romania will fulfill also 34 because uh, I, mean, I can say that any, every time I am visited in uh, our Ministry of Energy uh, from uh, a delegation of investors are very interested to, to invest in uh, green energy without uh, support, without state aid, but uh, having uh, predictability and stability in the, uh, both in the primary legislation, also in the secondary legislation. I think this is scope of work for uh, Romanian uh, uh, Ministry of Energy, uh, Romanian regulator, uh, in which uh, I have many friends that are very committed to, to, to impose uh, uh, the rules, especially regulation, new regulations that are enforced starting 1st of uh, January. Uh, I, I think uh, Romania is able to, to fulfill the, the, the goals for uh, uh, green uh, uh, obligations. I, th I think that the Director General wants to make a comment, and I realize you have to leave this right afterwards to, to catch a plane. Yes, sorry to, to come back in, Ambassador, and, and, and thank you. Just a very brief comment, because I think you've made some, some pertinent points, both about the increasing investor interest, what we see in, uh, in green energy and renewable energy in Europe, with the long-term plans we have, with the targets we have. Uh, we're obviously creating a regulatory framework with um, investor security and more predictability, and we already see that that has helped increase both investment in renewable energy projects and clean energy projects, but it's also increased returns, which means that large institutional investors are, are looking that way as well and are building up portfolios that are renewable and part of the climate um, uh, climate work that we are that we are undertaking. Um, in relation to the specific national energy and climate plan that um, that you referred to, that the state secretary referred to. Um, what we are doing as part of our governance regulation in Europe is to combine that with a number of measures that some of them are gap-filling measures at European level, so where we see that member states have challenges in meeting the targets. There are a number of things we can do together at European level to support the national action. And so we know that there may be some member states that right now are not quite sure how they will arrive at the targets in 2030, but a lot will happen between now and 2030, both in terms of innovation and technology, but also in terms of the measures we can take together to support um, Romania, among others. One important aspect of that that I want to underline is uh, what we call the Just Transition Mechanism uh, and Sustainable Finance. We will be adopting this, uh, this week in Strasbourg two uh, proposals, uh, two frameworks, one is on Just Transition, exactly to help regions that have been dependent on coal or other fossil fuels to make the transition to cleaner energy and to make sure that we move towards into the transition uh, and move out of fossil fuels and decarbonize um, our, gas, uh, um, our gas supply. Um, and then we are adopting a framework for sustainable investment and finance to make sure that both, both public and private funds know where to go when they are targeting um, uh, the, green, the green sector. So I think we're working on putting together a firm framework for both investments, but also for the necessary transition and the social changes that that implies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we understand why you have to leave. Let me, um, uh, let me go to, uh, uh, to Maria uh, Rita Galli uh, to briefly talk about uh, what SNAM is doing uh, with respect to new technologies. Uh, we heard a lot from your CEO this morning about that. So if in just a, we're already almost beginning to think about running out of time in 25 minutes or a half hour, so if you can briefly uh, uh, talk about that. 
thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for uh, having me here. And uh, of Is course, uh, a lot. Lo yeah, it's on. Is it on? Okay. Yes, yes. A lot has been uh, said already this morning with respect, of course, uh, to uh, the role of gas in the energy transition, and uh, to and and of course. Uh, as uh, the largest European transmission system operator, what we are doing, of course, is uh, challenging ourselves in understanding how the gas grid can help and can support the decarbonization. Uh, starting from one consideration, uh, which is not only related to SNAM, but in general, Europe has more than 200,000 high pressure pipeline, uh, 200,000 kilometers of high pressure pipeline, and millions of kilometers of distribution pipelines. So we have a very highly interconnected and reliable, quite young network that can that has a, a big value has been built uh, is underground so does not require big new investment and a big of course impact on the environment itself so the key question for us is how we can uh, uh, decarbonize and help uh, uh, the process by leveraging on uh, the existing infrastructure and making sure also that uh, the cost for this energy transition are affordable of course uh, for the end consumer and uh, the key pillar in that we have identified are, of course, first of all, an integrated approach. So integrated mean avoiding silos between electricity and gas networks and sector coupling and making sure that this sector coupling happen at various levels. So we can go, of course, from transforming electricity in hydrogen and blending hydrogen, transporting it to the network, which for, for us is uh, one of the most important pillar, but at much lower level, uh, and I think Marco was mentioning this morning we are thinking on how we can use our compressor stations that run out of both gas and electricity to balance uh, the electricity network so that when there are uh, excess peak of electricity production we can compress the gas and then when uh, there are peak of demand of course we can uh, instead use gas vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis electricity to compress the gas in the network and thinking about the fact that we are talking about hundreds of billion cubic meter in the network these uh, uh, you know, flexibility tool uh, which has never been exploited can be significantly big and help uh, the, mm, the, uh, the, the, the increase the efficiency of the overall system. Uh, another important pillar is uh, to use more and more uh, um, the, the infrastructure as a multi-purpose. And of course, uh, hydrogen is one angle, the other angle is biomethane. There is a huge potential in Europe for biomethane, and uh, biomethane is a direct way of decarbonizing the gas industry because we don't need to change anything. We can uh, simply connect the biomethane plant, transform existing biogas, upgrading them in biomethane, and, uh, uh, and also developing new biomethane uh, and in order to use uh, both uh, uh, agriculture but also urban wastes to, to produce uh, energy. So this is, again, a way through which a circular economy and the better use of existing infrastructure can support uh, the decarbonization uh, effort. And in this respect, the European TSOs have uh, sponsored an independent study that has indicated that uh, uh, there is a potential in Europe of approximately 200 billion cubic meters per year of green gases that can be produced and can be injected into the network. And by uh, you know, investing in green gases vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a pure 100% electrification approach, this could help saving more than, again, 200 billion uh, of, <laughs> of additional capex. So there's a, these are all the efforts that as NAM uh, we are today putting in place to make sure that, uh, let's say, the, the greed is part of the solution. That, that interference was not to tr cut you off. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, th but thank you for your comments. And I think one of the things that's most significant about what you're saying uh, is that if the US and EU is going to cooperate on new technologies, it has to be done with the private sector and with kind of companies like SNAM uh, that's doing the work. Uh, that's doing the work that you're doing, companies that are working on other things like uh, making gas production more, environmental, more environmentally friendly through methane emissions, carbon capture, and the like, that that's, uh, that's absolutely critical uh, to be part of what gets done. Uh, let me go uh, to Aida uh, from EBRD um, and uh, ask you a very direct question, and th there may be some confusion on this. There's 
I think that there's general agreement, certainly there has been today, <clears throat> that gas is going to continue to be important for Europe. And that uh, uh, gas production is declining uh, in, in part in Europe, and even though demand may be flat, there may be still a need for more uh, gas, um, for more gas imports, and I, I'll suggest more gas infrastructure. Uh, EIB and I think EBRD have policies that are not very thrilled about doing more projects uh, with respect to gas infrastructure. Uh, and with, as I understand it, at least for new projects, possibly staying with some of the more, uh, projects that are existing and on the books. Uh, could you explain what EB, EBRD's position is? And uh, I might at least ask the question, given what may be the need for gas uh, over the, at least the midterm, uh, is it a sound policy? Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me to the panel. It's, it's, it's a really interesting discussion. Um, EBRD policy was adopted slightly over a year ago, and it's been quite an eventful year for us internally, and of course externally we see the climate change, it's not just Australia burning, we see US southeast, hit by storms, uh, torrential rains here in Abu Dhabi, so we are very well aware of climate change going on. Um, our uh, energy strategy uh, goes until 2023, and it's actually much more aligned than people think with what uh, EAB adopted as their uh, energy lending policy. In the sense of still acknowledging that gas uh, will continue to play a role to decarbonize energy systems, and uh, it goes, in our case, it goes hand in hand with renewables, which occupy an enormous part of the energy business that the VRD are doing. Um, just this, as of today, we, saw, we uh, invested in nine gigawatt of renewables. And last year was 1.5 gigawatt. And that year was double of the previous year. So it's exponential growth in what we do on renewables. We are also very well aware that to support intermittent renewables in our region, we do need gas uh, as a fuel for base load capacity. We also need gas in some countries where uh, coal is indigenous. It's not necessarily European countries. I'm thinking Kazakhstan, for example, but CO2 emissions is a global phenomenon. And there, it's, it's, it's the country is burning coal 80% of its generation. So we're, we're introducing renewables, but, but also supporting what we call gasification of those countries. And of course, uh, in our view, European energy security, decarbonization go hand in hand. It's, it's stability, uh, EBRD's investment in the Southern Gas Corridor, which um, covers 3,500 kilometers, going all the way through Turkey to Europe, um, <clears throat> is, is, is a testament to that. The project yields 20 million tons of CO2 savings because it does support renewables, but also because it helps countries, say, in West Balkans to switch from coal to gas to less carbon um, intensive fuels. Um, in terms of what's happening internally in this year, there's a whole sustainable infrastructure group established that covers cross-sectorally transport, energy, urban, uh, with, the, with the purpose of decarbonization. And gas infrastructure is actually part of the business as of, as of now, that, that the business we're doing. The bank also adopted what we call shadow carbon pricing which looks at all projects that involve um, CO2 emissions above a certain threshold. And this is sort of an internal checks and balances tool. We are the first MDB to adopt that. And that helps us to look uh, at, at, at projects, including uh, projects that involve gas. Overall, of course, we are driven by the paradigm, the energy paradigm, the, the energy trilemma um, of um, secure, affordable, and sustainable energy solutions, and this is what drives, drives, our, uh, drives our activities. Um, gas, when, when approaching gas investments in gas infrastructure and, um, in, in, and related activities, we look at things like for gas not to displace lower carbon solutions, not to lock in carbon, not to end up with stranded assets, because there are also, as a financier, there are financial risks associated with that. We all heard about the task force on the financial disclosure. So 
this is why the shadow carbon pricing we are doing comes into play. And this is also why we are looking very carefully at what, what, what did you call future proofing. Hydrogen, we are really, really optimistic and hopeful uh, that there will be projects in our region that could help as, as soon as maybe top uh, that we finance as well that will start adding hydrogen to the to the gas systems and help with the decarbonization. So overall, um, we think that the that the, as per the, our energy strategy, there is um, there's a place for 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 in certain countries and, and given our geography, there's a certain place for gas to help drive decarbonization agenda forward. Let me ask you a, a, a hypothetical question based upon what you said. Let's assume that somewhere <clears throat> in Central or Eastern Europe uh, there's a determination that there's a need for another LNG terminal, a new project for an LNG terminal, and that that LNG will serve two purposes. Uh, it will help uh, reduce in countries A, B, or C uh, the use of coal, uh, or one, but two, it can also help to uh, complement renewables, that there'd be basically a dual, you know, dual purpose. Would EBRD be able to uh, help to finance that project? Thank you. I think this is the, the project that actually EBRD have been, has been looking at, and it's exactly for the reason that you defined. It's, it's, um, it's bringing uh, cleaner fuel to coal, um, to, to countries that have entrenched coal, and uh, helping diversify the resources. Again, it has to be done properly, and we're very selective how it's done, and um, there is a very rigorous analysis going into, um, into emissions calculations uh, and things like that, but given the air quality issues that we face in some of our countries, which is a local issue. Coal is, is I mean, we, sh we shut the door on coal to the extent that we have to find, uh, we have to find um, a lower carbon alternative. Of course, just transition that Diti, you mentioned, goes hand in hand with, with that activity to help countries move away from that. So, yes. Brief, very briefly, are you saying that there's some misunderstanding as to what your policy is as to f financing future gas-related projects? There is. We we are not financing. There might be. There is. We're not financing upstream oil. We haven't been financing coal since 2013 and under the uh, old policy. There was a carve out saying exceptional and rare circumstances. We have not used that carve out. So under the new policy, we're out of upstream oil. And it's, it's really renewables and gas that we see as a, as a dual, so. Clarifying at least my understanding. Uh, okay, thank you, Aida. Uh, and last but not least, but the person I've known the longest, uh, Andrea Lockwood, Dep Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Energy. And I would ask, please be brief, because we want to get to some questions, uh, but maybe specifically, I think there's also, some people don't realize how much the U.S. actually has been doing in Europe, even under this administration, uh, particularly the PTEC project, which hopefully will be is done, will be definitely, would be done in coordination with Brussels and maybe the U.S. EU Energy Council. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where you think uh, we're going from the U.S. side. Briefly, please. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, thank you, and, and thanks uh, for having us here. And, and we are, just to, to reiterate uh, what uh, Ditta was saying, on the U.S.-EU Energy Council, uh, you know, we're, we're very proud of the 10 years of work that we've done together. And I, and I do think that there is ongoing uh, cooperative work in uh, research uh, Together between our our national laboratories and and uh, and the EU's uh, counterparts, particularly in areas like hydrogen and energy storage uh, and natural gas, uh, we have a new uh, initiative to uh, to look at uh, ways to both uh, capture flaring and. Uh, 
and reduce methane emissions and natural gas. So, so we're very excited about the work that we can do together. Um, PTEC is the Partnership for Transatlantic Energy Cooperation, and, and it came out of a uh, sec then Secretary Perry uh, was asked by President Trump to attend the Three Cs Conference. Uh, uh, in in those nations uh, had some very particular concerns about uh, malign influence in the energy sector, the, the countries along the uh, Eastern European border. And what we committed to do, and, and uh, the EU is a part of that too, is to work with particular countries to, to put together uh, answers to make uh, their countries more energy secure and resilient, to look at ways to address cybersecurity, um, and to look at uh, pipeline interconnections, transmission interconnections, um, and, and energy efficiency and renewable energy. We are very committed uh, to a what we call an all of the above, but it's, it's all technologies and, and ways to look at innovation uh, to, to make all fuels cleaner. Um, and we and we believe that each country, particularly the countries uh, uh, along Eastern Europe, are are making uh, a transition uh, at a reliant on different fuel sources uh, for many. And so we want to work with uh, technological innovation to try to to bring people together uh, and move everyone towards a, our cleaner energy goals. So that's uh, the the. Uh, uh, PTEC has met uh, three times. Uh, we're about to put together an investment conference. Investment across the board in all of the four focus areas uh, is something that's very important. And I know, uh, you know, we've been very concerned about the uh, investment challenges in Romania that uh, that uh, our colleague was was talking about because it it is uh, the the more transparent. Uh, and more available uh, each country uh, is to investment, the more secure uh, and technologically advanced they can be. So I, I think uh, that may be a, a very short answer to, uh, to what we're doing, but we're very excited about uh, all of the work that we're doing uh, together with Europe and, uh, and believe that, uh, um, that we may have slightly different strategies to, to getting to our uh, clean energy future, but we are well on the way. I think it's important. I'm really glad that you pointed all that out because uh, people should understand that this administration is actually doing things. And, uh, uh, and I was 14 years as a Democratic political appointee, so I'm saying it from that vantage point. But I really do think that uh, Secretary Perry, and I hope now Secretary Briette, will uh, continue with respect to this. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, Andrea, but can we say that this will, that PTEC will be done in coordination with the Three Cs Initiative, in coordination with Brussels, uh, and bringing in other member states, which I think, like, like Germany, Austria, and, uh, and others as well. Yes, um, all of those nations and, uh, and the EU have been active participants in, uh, the, along with the three Cs and, uh, and the Baltic countries. There's a, the, the Baltics asked for a particular breakout, uh, Baltic three plus one, uh, the United States is the plus one. I think it's, it's, it's really uh, just uh, all of us together uh, need to come together to to meet the challenges and meet the goals and uh, and and we as you mentioned before that's not going to happen without the private sector's active participation as well so we are uh, excited about a new hopefully uh, flexible concept that that will allow uh, countries uh, particularly those uh, on the challenging periphery, of Europe uh, to to feel more secure, to feel like they're elevated uh, among other concerns, among other countries' concerns. Uh, you know, we're all addressing concerns, but uh, but these ones are are very real, uh, and and it's you know been demonstrated that uh, 
that energy can be used as a force uh, for malign influence. So we want to make sure that countries have the tools to address that. We're, we're uh, doing assessments uh, of uh, countries' energy situations and, and uh, looking at ways to address vulnerabilities uh, while continuing to pursue uh, you know, research and innovation topics. Thank you. Tom isn't very good at this. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Andrea. Uh, let me ask Andras, who, Andras Shimani, uh, who is my co-investigator with respect to this project, uh, if you have a few comments that you want to add. Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, I'd like to say I'm, I'm totally impressed. Andrash and I want to echo everything that you said, uh, and uh, uh, and that uh, the key I think the key issue that we have to solve is how to bridge that gap that uh, uh, that Andrash was talking about, and uh, I think doubling down on research and technological innovation is the at the end of the day is going to be the only way to get there. Uh, Let's have some comments. We have a few, we have a few minutes left. Uh, questions or comments from the audience? Ah, oh, we have a reporter back there. Charlene Howard from The Economist just raised her hand. This is a question for the Director General. Can you, uh, is there a, by the way, are there hand mics back I there? Can speak up. It's not that okay. that it's becoming or has already become uh, of less importance. 
Well, I think indeed, as you're alluding to, we've seen a number of important developments in the European gas market over the last decade. We have updated our regulation uh, to make clear uh, what is the scope of application of our gas, of our European uh, gas uh, legislation, uh, to make uh, uh, to build in the common interest and the energy union into our gas uh, regulation. Uh, we have. Uh, established a number of alternative both sources of supply but also uh, invested in LNG terminals and so our energy security um, and our longer term security is in a different situation now compared to was it what it was in uh, in 2009 uh, in addition to that um, and that's one thing that has struck me in the in the conversation uh, here in addition to that our green deal and our ambition, which was confirmed by our heads of state and government in December to become climate neutral in 2050, is also a significant push and shift in our energy policy because everything we'll do will be um, helping to support uh, that objective. And I think that was very clearly reflected in the interventions both from the EBRD and SNAM that we are continuing investment into infrastructure, but we are continuing investment into infrastructure in a manner that is future-proof um, and that focuses on infrastructure that has the flexibility to also cater for decarbonized gas in whatever form that might take, and there are different ways to, to get there. And so, yes, I think there is a significant shift in our market since 2009. I think the transparency in the market, the flexibilities, um, the, in, the very significant increase of LNG imports from the United States uh, over the last few years, uh, where I think we've seen close to a 700% increase. So in other words, the sourcing of our gas supply uh, is diversified very significantly compared to, to previously. And the recent trilateral negotiations and agreement um, on, uh, on transit with, uh, with Russia and Ukraine is another very, very useful contribution to security of supply and, uh, and diversification. Yeah, I want to, I, I want to agree with that. Um, and one of the major purposes of this project, even though many in the US, I'm not, admit, I'm not a great fan of Nord Stream 2, uh, but that uh, uh, developing this competitive and transparent market uh, and all of the steps that you mentioned did a, a way is to mitigate the effects of it. Let me also say, and I mentioned the deal that you just, the, uh, the, the deal between you, uh, Gazprom and, uh, and Ukraine, I think is significant and helps Ukraine more than I thought that that deal, you know, that that kind of deal was possible. Uh, and what I find is somewhat interesting is that, and, and I, I could be wrong, but the focused sanctions that were enacted by Congress uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, go, f sanctioning shipping companies that were laying the pipe uh, for Nord Stream 2. Uh, I, I almost have the impression that it was, rather than it becoming a huge issue between the United States and Europe, the, the reaction was sort of, so what? Uh, and that that uh, yes, it will delay the project, perhaps some, and it is a, uh, a question how long, but it has not been greeted with the kind of uh, animosity that had been talked about when more overall sanctions were being discussed in the United States some time ago. I will say that one concern that there is in the United States that I do think the commission has to take on very strongly is, you know, Gazprom has not been the greatest as far as keeping its word, and that there should be penalties, and I would even argue contingent sanctions, if Gazprom in bad faith breaches that deal. Uh, I, I hope it won't happen. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, those are, I guess, my few comments to your question. We have Neil, and then Bob Icord, and then the over, yeah, Natalia. Um, and we're running out of time. What, how, do you have like five more minutes? Two more minutes. Let's get all, let's get all three questions in a row, and hopefully, and we'll answer them in a row very quickly. Yeah, th uh, thanks to the panelists. Uh, this question is for Andrea. I, I want to ask about the other pipeline. Last week, Turkstream was inaugurated. Um, in many ways, it's actually much more dangerous from a U.S. geopolitical perspective than Nord Stream 2 because the recipients are much more vulnerable in many ways. 
um, and several of them are outside of the EU framework. Um, it, pardon the, 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 the terminology, but it feels like the US has been asleep at the wheel on TurkStream um, as compared to other projects. And so I'd like for you to sort of describe how the administration has seen that as a strategic priority and if there are efforts to try to uh, mitigate the, the geopolitical damage that- Okay, thanks. Happened. That's one question. Bob, 